Hello again, comrades. It's me, Matt. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Really appreciate you stopping by on today's video. I hope you're all keeping safe during these really challenging times. Hopefully today's video will give it a little bit of entertainment as we're all kind of locked up. Today we are talking about the MiG-21 Soviet air superiority back in its day. A very peculiar and very interesting uh, design of the aircraft. Whenever I look at the MiG-21, I think of Thunderbirds. If you've ever watched Thunderbirds, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, well, you're probably a little too young to understand what I'm talking about but uh, the MiG-21 is a rather unique aircraft it's basically a gigantic engine with a cockpit strapped to it and that is literally it uh, a very very powerful jet very powerful and today we are going to give it a bit of an overview so you can get a little bit more of an understanding as to how it came to be and what it is today so the MiG-21 is a single-engine jet fighter produced by Mikoyan Givech Design Bureau as an improvement on the previous generations of the MiG-17 and MiG-19 both have been used to very great effect in both the Korean War and the Vietnam War, but surprisingly the MiG-21 has been flying since 1953 and still to this day is used extensively in some air forces around the world. Its design characteristics, its simplicity and ability to fly at extremely high speeds has made it one of the greatest aircraft the world has ever seen. But the question then becomes why has the 20th century of the Cold War remained such a potent and reliable fighter bomber until the early years of the 21st century and still to be predicted to last much longer. Now the MiG-21 became known as NATO as the codename Fishbed and this aircraft was fast, I mean fast. At the time it could exceed the speed of sound making it a supersonic aircraft and could reach speeds of just beyond Mach 2. It also had an internal cannon plus the ability to carry between two and six missiles. However, this does not mean the MiG-21 fishbed would only serve as an air attack or defense role. On the contrary, its hybridity in the design meant that it could also serve as a strategic bomber in the ground attack role by carrying rockets and bombs, and potentially even nuclear weapons. This could also be based upon the assumption that during the military confrontation between the Soviet Union and its allies in the Warsaw Pact, with the United States and its main NATO allies, there would be a massive ground warfare across Central Europe, particularly in Germany. However, as we all know, such a major engagement between the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies against the United States and its allies in Central and Western Europe never happened during the Cold War, which ended in 1991. Furthermore, an interesting fact to point out is that the preferred Soviet command and control of air assets from the ground meant that the aircraft did not need more room for radars. With that being said, this helped keep the weight down and also allowed it to be a lot more maneuverable. The Soviet Union would later go on to produce this aircraft between the years of 1959 and 1985, which is an extensive production timeline for this aircraft. And according to the National Interest in 2017, the article, quote, Russia's MiG-21, the fighter jet that could fly it for 100 years, unquote, the Soviet Union was supposed to build up to 10,645 of these aircraft. Since its first flight, it has been exclusively sold to foreign air forces around the world, mainly because it's cheap, rugged and a fairly reliable fighter aircraft, but also that it was very good at working with ground coordination of forces. It lacked all the technological evolutions such as the in-house long-range radar and long-range guided missile capability. Later versions, however, incorporated an advanced avionics flight deck that allowed this fighter to compete with even third generation fighters. In total, over 5,000 MiG-21s that were placed into military service were built and operate in over 33 countries to this day. Outside of the F-16 Falcon, no other fighter jet has been so widely produced to this quantity and distributed so widely. The MiG-21's main battle strategy is pretty simple and involved fast ambushes and very hasty retreats. In the early days of the MiG-21, these fighters would optimally ambush enemy air formations and quickly speed off as fast as they could before retaliatory action could be taken against them. These guerrilla type air ambush tactics were perfected by the North Vietnamese towards the end of the Vietnam War. Part of the reason they were necessary was the lack of advanced avionics. The MiG-21 had raw speed and excellent maneuverability. This opened it up to the F-104 style offensives but precluded it from engaging in long, protracted dogfights with advanced aircraft. The most popular weapon of the MiG-21 it used was the AA-2 Atoll missile. This classic Soviet-era infrared homing missile was used for extreme close-range air-to-air attacks, accounting for all the vast majorities of the confirmed kills by the North Vietnamese. While the MiG-21 was equipped with a single 30mm cannon, it was extremely effective with short-range missiles against even advanced warfighters like the F-4C Phantom. 
In fact, this was one of the most frustrating aspects of the MiG-21 in its early encounters with the American Fighter Air Force. A relatively cheap, cost-effective and efficient compact fighter would run circles around the behemoths that the Navy spent almost a decade trying to perfect. Even after the Vietnam War, the MiG-21 jets have been active in some of the more notable foreign air forces such as India and Egypt, but also in Syria. These jets have served with distinction in each air force and currently occupy the fleets of 30 other countries. Despite the technological improvements of the avionics decks of modern aircraft as the MiG-21, most modern third and fourth generation fighters just cannot surpass the MiG-21 in terms of speed. While they have the advanced systems for detection, evasion and targeting, they cannot outrush or outmaneuver this aircraft. However, there is a lot of debate over this. Modern day aircraft are really not designed to be placed upon dogfights anymore and the advances of radar and long range missiles really negate the fact of the aircraft needing to be fast. Therefore, this makes it more ideal for a air defense role in today's modern air forces. With no immediate plans to scrap these fleets, this jet is on the track to continue flying for the foreseeable future. In addition, if the F-16 does not surpass it with time, the MiG-21 will be the oldest fighter jet in the entire world still serving. Another interesting factor comes into play when the Chinese decided to reverse engineer the MiG-21 and acquired all the technical data and blueprints in order to produce their own version called the Shendu J-7, otherwise known as the F-7. Statistically, the Chinese produced around 2,400 F-7s of the MiG-21 variant between 1966 and still to 2013. During the Cold War, the Warsaw Pact ally Czechoslovakia built 194, which was under license from the Soviet Union. India, an ally of the Soviets but not officially part of the Warsaw Pact, shared defense technology with the Soviet Union, and as a result of the defense agreement with the Soviet leadership, it would construct 657. Romania, a communist country in 1962, the Romanian Air Force received 12 MiG-21 F-13s, followed by 12 of the same variant in 1963. Deliveries over several years continued, with the Romanian Air Force having a total of 322 of these aircraft. In Bulgaria, a Warsaw Pact country received 224 MiG-21 aircraft. In addition, Yugoslavia, also a communist federal republic, but did not military align with the Warsaw Pact, purchased 261 MiG-21s in 10 different variants, some of which were later used during the Yugoslav Wars. In addition, the MiG-21 deliveries to Libya started in 1975 of 21 MiG-21 trainers, followed by 50 MiG-21 MFs. However, 30 MiGs were later transferred to Syria in 1982. From 1980, 94 MiG-21 BIs were delivered, and interestingly enough, 31 MiG-21s still in operation, according to an Israeli intelligence report. Given the fact that time has moved on in technology and air and ground attack abilities, the MiG-21's economic cost, utility and ability to act both as a fighter and as a bomber leads to third world states and others who have inherited the MiG-21 to keep it in operation. For most developing countries, they may not simply want the most of the technological advanced aircraft, which they just don't need and simply doesn't need to work for them. They just want something that works as a fighter aircraft. And the MiG-21 fits the bill, and it has for some time. People aren't just buying these things just because they're there. They're buying them because they last, and they know the capabilities of what it can do for what their military wants it to do. In my own opinion, it's that the Chinese version, the J-7, has brought greater longevity to the overall design of the MiG-21, and extensive operational history means it's quite a formidable fighter. I would try and say that it could be tailored to fit more to the ground attack aircraft today's functions, really, because in terms of air-to-air -air attack roles, there's just too much technology flying around in the sky, and this thing would be knocked out before it even hit the missile button. While its numbers are in decline, it still sees operation around the world, of course still in Syria in the Syrian Civil War, and has stood the test of time in history as one of the world's most iconic aircraft and has earned the respect of both a friend and a foe. Of course, a lot of people have been messaging me on my channel lately saying, Matsumus, why do you have so much respect for a piece of military equipment that could have actually at one point killed you or killed some of your fellow friends? You have to remember, folks, that I'm only respecting upon the equipment itself and the engineering of the aircraft, not so much the ability of what it can do to kill others or to, you know, maim or hurt, because military hardware is impressive to me. Um, it's always fascinated me, just the way in which it's designed. Yes, I understand it has a purpose to kill or to uh, engage the enemy or whatever hostile force it's it's fighting with, but for me, I'm, I'm fascinated by its, its engineering marvel, the way in which they operate, the way in which they perform. To me, that's really fascinating. So there's no sort of bias behind my videos. There's no bias behind what I like 
um, you know, in terms of military equipment. I understand some of these weapon systems that I do review uh, could have been placed against me or in conflicts around the world to others and those of you who have served or are about to serve, but it's not about that, and I just want to make that very clear. Surprisingly, for such a lean and fast aircraft, it could carry a fair amount of armament. Located to the left of the cockpit was the twin barrel GSH-23, which was a 23mm cannon, which was later upgraded to a 30mm cannon, with a standard 420 rounds carried. Optionally, there was a variety of air-to-air -air missiles, the R3, the R-13M, the R-60, and for other later models even more improved. The unguided bombs or rockets increased also, with a total of 2,000 kilograms of ordnance could be carried at any one time. Being that the aircraft was highly manoeuvrable for its time though, it really was not destined to be a ground bomber. In its many years of service, the MiG-21 has generated excellent combat record as well, for the most part. Against Pakistani F-86s, F-104s and MiG-19s, it performed respectably, taking down several while suffering a few losses itself. Against well-trained Israeli pilots and their Mirage 3s and F-4s, the MiG-21 and its mediocre pilots performed quite poorly with many shot down. In Vietnam, the MiG-21 showed its true capabilities though, shooting down dozens of American F-4s and F-105s, mostly in close-range dogfights where its maneuverability and lower speed gave it the edge. Overall, the MiG-21 has proved to be a highly successful fighter with low price and much agility, and something that we may see disbanded soon, but not quite yet. There were absolutely hundreds of variants of this aircraft, and I could literally spend all day listing them, but I'm not going to. It's safe to say, though, that the MiG-21 was one of the most versatile aircraft they could configure into whatever country needed it the most. The conclusion of this aircraft is really that while the MiG-29 Fulcrum appeared in the 1980s to replace the MiG-21 fish bed in the Soviet inventory, China and India maintain a healthy fleet of MiG-21s and related developments. India MiGs were updated to keep them flying amazingly up to 2025. Should this happen, it should make the MiG-21, as I said, one of the biggest success stories of the Cold War and military aviation in general. Considering she was brought online from 1959 and potentially 2025 would mean 66 years of operational service, not just flying service, operational service, and that's an amazing feat considering its origins. At any regard, the MiG-21 has amassed a very respectable combat record and has proven as a steady cost-effective performer, a complete market success for the MiG firm whose basic beginnings saw her produce only marginally effective fighter-producing aircraft of World War II. So, there you have it folks, the MiG-21, a very, very cool aircraft, absolutely steeped in history. I could talk about this thing all day long, there is so much to talk about, but of course I'm not going to bore you to death. I'm just giving you a bit of an overview of the aircraft. Lots of stories based upon this aircraft too, of course, a lot of combat operational history and stories that come with, you know, certain engagements that I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. I am fascinated by this aircraft, mainly for the fact that it is basically just a, you know, F1 race car with a couple of missiles strapped to the side of it, and it is fast as lightning. I love that. Uh, you know, the ambush maneuvers that they used were very effective. You don't often see that in, you know, the aviation world, especially modern aviation world, of kind of ambush guerrilla tactics, but it worked. It worked in Vietnam very, very well. And uh, I don't know if we're going to see much more of these aircraft in the future. Of course, times are changing, uh, cost effectiveness and all that sort of stuff, especially with the technology advancing. Dogfights and air-to-air uh, -air missile combat with this kind of aircraft doesn't make much sense anymore. There's too much advanced technology there. But uh, really fascinating nonetheless. I hope you enjoyed today's video, folks. Please, please leave me a comment. I'd love to hear about something that you feel about this aircraft. If I did make any mistakes, I do apologize. If you did enjoy the video, please leave me a like. I'd encourage you to also click the little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified of any upcoming content in the future. If you do want to support my channel, you can go check out my Patreon page, which is also in the description box below, along with my Facebook, my merchandise store, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. Uh, I hope to catch you around next time everyone and once again i hope you're all staying really safe during this uh, crisis that we have going on and i'll see you on the next one all the best bye bye